Hello and welcome to the Truth Halloween live stream commentary. Oh, holy crap, here it is. Halloween's here, folks. And here we go. We're going to do a live stream commentary, our first live stream commentary. Uh, and uh, let me just warn you, it's a, it's a little glitchy, a little beta-y. You know, we ran into some problems setting up today, so it's not quite where we'd like it. But it's going to be a fun new way where, you know, we'll give something a try. It's going to be, it's going to be great. It's going to be fucking awesome. Awesome. Chris. Chris. Where the fuck are you, man? Chris? Hey, dude. You're, you're not even dressed up, dude. What the fuck? What? You're, What's going you're on? Not, you're not even dressed up. Not with this beer, though. I thought we agreed we were going to dress up. For what? For the live stream Halloween commentary. Look. He lost me. Well, what the... Jeez. Well, we, we agreed that we would do this, and oh, what the fuck ever. What, whatever. Are you in your pajamas? Some. All right. So, Generally, folks, here's... I sleep naked. Thank you. Thanks. Good. I sleep not quite naked, um, but sometimes I find that my... Um, I sleep in my underwear, and my willy falls out of the little hole sometimes. Little, yeah. Yeah. So, it's like I'm naked. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so this is Chris Shalom, the, hey everybody. the the writer and co-producer of Truth, um, and director, and director of some scenes. Hey, did you direct any scenes? No, 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 none at all. I, I think, think so. you directed that scene that that we cut out of the movie where we had a fishing rod. And we were pulling a, a stick through the forest. I seem to. Oh yeah, that was, that was my scene. idea. I was really passionate about that from the beginning. Yeah. So that what this idea was, folks, is uh, Chris thought it would be really cool is if we just attached, you know, a, um, a fishing rod to this like tiny little stick, and then you know just film film it being pulled through the the forest. Uh, he thought that would you know be a ghostly encounter or something. That definitely wasn't me. That was Chris. Definitely me. Definitely, Chris. Well, I guess, I guess, I guess we should probably just start on this this uh, commentary. Give me a sec here, one sec. I gotta get this stupid thing. Since you didn't dress up any, um, nice mask, eh? Five dollars. Not even five dollars. I think it was like four something. Uh, you you get all the Halloween, uh, you know, deals now because it's only a day away from Halloween. Pretty cool, eh? Pretty cool. Yeah, thanks, man. All right. Let's start this thing. Let's start it. Let's start it up. How many commentaries is this now we've done? Well, you've done one more than me. I guess so, yeah. How many commentaries? Oh, I guess it's only our second commentaries of, of truth. Oh, it started. It's starting. There we go. <laughs> I am so fed up with that that song. <laughs> oh my gosh! Every time, every, every time it time. comes up, and because I often go to the the Cali Balloons uh, uh, page just to you know check out our our uh, our hits and you know take a look at what's going on. That's the first thing that pops up every yeah. time I jump onto there. Totally. So it's. <laughs> In, um, what was it, our, our second trailer when we had um, Andrew Gus? No, you edited our second trailer, Chris, and um, uh, yeah. did it to me to do the finishing touches. Mistake. And uh, I took it and, you know, did a little bit of the sound and uh, some of the color correction. And, yeah, that was the mistake right there. And then I thought it was wise to put in, like, half a minute of... Um, Opening logos, um, which everyone was very angry at me about. <laughs> but it was already well, up and 
and you can see you can see on analytics the uh, on Google Analytics the, the the drop drop rate the viewer drop rate for that first trailer and there's this huge chunk of of, of the viewers that <laughs> bail out before the fucking logo's done because it takes so <laughs> long. They get out before Enterprise season shows up on the CMHL logo. <laughs> they, they make it to L and they're like, "Fuck this." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was a mistake. And then I kept it up, yeah. But we did a lot of that on Truth, just a lot of learning and, you know, um, a lot of learning, a lot of learning. Did we implement anything that we learned in April? Um, I don't even know. My instinct is yes. <laughs> That's something we talked about. Uh, I know we I know we um, we ended up implementing more. We well, I felt that we learned more from Android Night Punch than we did from yeah you know, either of our features. Yeah. Our big features. Yeah. Which is funny. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, we had. Relatively speaking, we had such a we had such a luxurious schedule on Truth. I mean, it didn't seem that way at the time, but but in comparison to our to our follow up projects, and 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 even in comparison to, well, I guess like bigger indie features, like once you start getting into the the low budget end of filmmaking with with film and stuff, like we had such a relaxed schedule compared to. I don't know, like cash back or something like that. Yeah, we really did. We really did. And we didn't really cut much from the script either, did we? Um, like, I, I know there was maybe one or two shots or scenes that we had to hurry up on, but I don't mm -hmm. think we actually... Did we actually cut anything from the shoot while we were shooting? I don't think so. No, I think you're right. I think we actually shot the whole shooting script, which is uh, strange. <laughs> Especially as, for as, us. As opposed to Android Night Punch, where we shot... Uh, what is it? I think I think 26 pages of a 42-page of a script. <laughs> <laughs> Just so everyone knows, Android Night Punch is... Uh, well, you'll be seeing it very soon. It's going to be up on Cali Bloom Films. And um, it's a feature film that we shot in uh, a weekend. Well, not three days. We went from concept to rap in three days. It was a challenge that I, I uh, opposed to Chris. Opposed? Op uh, proposed to Chris. Proposed. Yeah. So it makes a little bit of sense that we lost lots of the script there. <laughs> Anyways, well, I guess back to the movie. What's going on in the movie? I was, um, I was actually just telling someone that this is my least favorite part of the entire film. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was a bit of a catastrophe. Um, even in the edit, um, not not that Gusto did anything wrong, but we had such weird coverage that it was really tough to uh, edit it, yeah. edit it together. Well, I really do think. I mean, we've we've told the story about the piano. Before, but to reiterate briefly, it was supposed to be a piano, and we couldn't get the piano because it was roughly the weight of the sun, as it turned out, when we tried to lift it. Um, so we balked at that, and she turned into a guitar teacher. Um, and I, I think it's I think it's interesting how much that turned out, in my in my view, to affect the scene, and in this case, negatively, um, that we had this really. Well, that we had this aspect of the scene that that doesn't necessarily seem central, like the the specific instrument she's teaching is important. But I I do think it really changed the dynamic of the scene from what I envisioned. And I do feel I always feel like this scene is off, and I feel like part of that is because uh, uh, we were just thrown off by the by the piano thing. I agree. I agree too. And I think it's partially because I'm such a visual director, and I had some great visuals for that scene. Um, and I thought that those visuals could have really set up um, more of their relationship, just just the visuals themselves rather than the dialogue mm. that really were missed because 
it's it's a pretty static thing, a guitar. You know, like they're sitting in chairs across the room from each other. It yeah. looks a little stupid. And then, you know, and there's a kid playing a guitar. Uh, I imagine sh- shots with, like, the piano in the foreground and, like, the, the keys being pressed, um, which would have been, I think, yeah, more interesting to watch and would have added more to the story as well. It's definitely a more cinematic instrument. I mean, how do you shoot a guitar except you <laughs> you do your, your close-up <laughs> of the hands and then you tilt up to the face and that's your guitar shot, basically. Well, we could have done a lot of jump cuts. We could have like had like Dutch tilts and like zoomed in on him playing the guitar. Yeah, or we could have like, like tele- done jump cuts like, and everything. We could have like telephotoed down the neck of the guitar and then done a rack focus. Yeah, up the guitar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and then we could have like done a, some jump cuts up to like <laughs> uh, Beth's belly and like rack focus like through her belly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As she's rubbing it. Yeah, and we could have just ripped off the the CG fetus shots from inside. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we could have zoomed right into her stomach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that would have made a better movie. Would have made the scene better. <laughs> it's true. It's, no, it's not true. That's too far. <laughs> but this, um, I, I think it's true. This stuff, interestingly, I think like. For me, this is the stuff in the first act that's really, really engaging. Is well, this shot basically just because it's played so fantastically. I, I don't think I'm not to talk down about your half of the writing, Jay, but I don't think there's anything fantastic about the writing here, particularly. But I think the performances are really good in this first uh, meeting of of Becca and Guy, and really give give us a sense of of them. I th- I think I agree definitely too, and I think it's uh, partially because I remember that shot. Again, I always go to the shots, but that shot we just kind of threw together, um, and I was frustrated with it. But, you know, it doesn't really matter um, because, like you said, the performances are, are spot on, um, definitely. I've got, a, uh, I've got a text message here from a, uh, a Scott Beakey. Okay. He says he insists on a shout-out on our live commentary. So, Scott Beakey, this is going out to you. Okay, Scott, um, I never really liked you. I just kind of put up with you because you knew Chris. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 kind of what he means, right? By a shout-out? Yes, yeah, I think that will keep him satisfied for now. Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, if you want, you know, you can send me an email. Pictures of yourself. Actually, that goes for anybody. Do you want to sh- send pictures of themselves to me? Yeah, it's fine. In in what way will that help them? Um. Well. Um. Well, we'll we'll get to that after the pictures are sent. I think. Deal. I think yeah, it it will at some point help them. Yeah. I never really liked you. I guess if 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 they could also mail contracts that. Uh, are signed by them, giving us the use of the pictures. That would be. Cool. I was I was totally not listening to you. Our executive producer for this live stream, Kat Jeffcott, um, <laughs> telling me something with sign language, so uh, I wasn't really listening. Um, again, I want to. That being said, all these poor people who are watching this right now, um, this is this is pretty thrown together. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, Kat came home and was able to help us, so uh, I just want to do a shout-out for Kat as well as that other guy you were talking about. So, yeah. Oh, this is such a pretty shot here. Ugh. Well, this is, again, I'm sure we've said this before, but this is where we were initially thinking about uh, uh, filming uh, a much later scene in the movie and an important scene in the movie. And that ended up getting moved, but uh, that that lake was just so interesting. It looked. looked oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah we were going to shoot the climax, which has now been cut from the film, uh, at oh, that lake. I wasn't sure if we were talking about that. That's why I was being so vague. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think we mentioned that we cut the end of the movie at some point, didn't we? I don't know. Anyway, we well, cut we the did. end of the movie. We cut the end of the movie. <laughs> But we had great plans for that scene at the lake. weren't we gonna get we were gonna get like glow sticks 
and throw them into the lake so that the lake would like glow and everything. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we had we had definitely if definitely that was where we overreached in general was our our planning with the well, no, where we overreached in general was our planning with the cold <laughs> cuz we had this we had our indie sensibility that it would be you know, hilarious to have all these actors and they'd be horribly uncomfortable and they'd be acting in the cold and we'd put them in the water and it would just be kind of that funny like Sam Raimi, Bruce Campbell thing. <laughs> Uh, but it wasn't. <laughs> it, it was much too too far. If if they had had you know sprained ankles and we'd been poking them with sticks, that maybe would have been different and funnier. But 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 uh, sex scenes in in sub zero temperatures just aren't really funny as it turns out. No no yeah we had again that was the same thing we had great yeah great ideas for that sex scene and then um, yeah we just couldn't force. We couldn't force poor Natasha in. Dousing her with ice cold water and then putting her out into the freezing cold. <laughs> yeah. We're, a little, we're not quite that heartless. Yeah. That's our exact plan, too. We're going to go out at 2 a.m., and then we're, we'll need you to be really, really wet from head to toe in the cold. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and she was going to do it, too. She's like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> the worst, I'm ready. And we're like, that's well, the worst part. actually, yeah. maybe, <laughs> maybe we won't do it. <laughs> yeah. Clearly clearly yeah. don't deserve actors like that. No. Oh, well, although we, we didn't do it. So. so there we go. So, yeah. you know, redeemed ourselves a little bit there. Yeah. <laughs> You're Somewhere. almost done your... Yeah. A local brew. Um, so we're just leading up to the uh, the shot with the big uh, the big onset argument of the shoot. Yep, yep, where I was uh, screaming at Mike Russell. Yeah. I think I think it's blown up more than... Actually, did I actually scream or did I just be like, oh, you fucking guy. Uh, I don't think there was actually screaming. You like Canadians? I, I remember it differently. It was like a Canadian. It's like a Canadian director blow up. You were like, "I'm sorry, I'm so mad." <laughs> I had a good one. I was at a cafe the other day, and um, I was sitting there, and uh, I was at one of those tables, you know, with the four nice chairs surrounding it. You know, every cafe has those. You know, a table, and then it has the four comfy chairs surrounding it. Every cafe has and, a table um, on this, we can agree. Yeah, and but, but you know what I'm talking about, like the big comfy chairs. Yeah, yeah no, like, I, sorry, I don't. But there's only a couple of them, yeah. So I was sitting there by myself, and then these two, this couple comes up, and they're like, oh, do you mind if we take these two chairs? And I'm like, oh, no, go for it. Sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go, go, go. <laughs> and then I'm like, do, do you want me to move? I can move. It's okay. <laughs> And afterwards, I was like, yeah, that was a very Canadian <laughs> response to uh, that situation, yeah. It's funny, um, you talk to some people who, um, you know, work in casting in Vancouver, and uh, they mention how all the Americans, uh, you know, they come down and cast for their big movies down here, and they know right away when they're looking at a Canadian actor. Yeah, like, uh, you know. Instantly, it's like the the accent and the way they act and everything. Um, so when I was looking at Truth the other day, I was wondering, you know, if when people watch it, if they if they know right away it's a you know a Canadian movie, or if they think it's a an American movie. Now you can tell it's Canadian. I wonder if there's total lack of conflict. This is, this is my Halloween costume. I'm a. Uh, it's good. I'm a Sith. A, an, env <laughs> an environmentally conscious Sith. <laughs> is what? What? Is there something on your hoodie? Is that why you say that? It's green. Oh, it's, it's to environment. The color, the color of Mother Earth, Jason. <laughs> okay. Is that what environmentally friendly people do? Wear earthy green colors? To, yeah. 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 Oh, well, here we go. Here's um, 
we bring it up every time, but there's our, our quick shot of um, uh, Dr. Spagent's oh, Nathan Dashwood, who is cut <laughs> from the movie, unfortunately. Uh, that was terrible, having to call him and tell him. For reasons uh, entirely not his fault, to be clear. No, not at all, no. He did an amazing <laughs> job. We just wrote too much. <laughs> he, he was cut for, for playing the character that we wrote. Yeah, and doing it the way we wanted it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He was cut because we wrote him. That's it, yeah. <laughs> he was cut because we wrote him into the movie. Um, but we, we didn't actually have him completely gone until pretty pretty close to the premiere. We were holding on to a few bits. Um, and then we decided to cut the rest. And it was pretty close to the premiere. And I'll admit, I, I put it off a little bit because I didn't want to tell him because I felt terrible. Uh, and it was pretty close to the premiere, and I think he had already said that he was going to be going. And I called him up, and I'm like, well, Nathan, I just, you know, I wanted to let you know that you're not in the movie anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was really good, but he didn't end up going to the premiere. So, uh, yeah. And, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> I, to I totally respect that, yeah. <laughs> oh, did we miss the wine line? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. That's what happens when you don't have audio. We really don't know what's going on in the video, because I don't know about you, Chris, but on my screen, it's, like, that big. Um, yeah, and yeah. super, super not smooth. Yeah, well, that's the way it is for everybody right now. Oh, uh, so we bad. apologize. <laughs> we apologize. This is what we were talking about where it was completely just a fuck-up. Um, apparently, I, I could have sworn that YouTube allowed you to play YouTube videos on the Hangouts and broadcast it, but I did a test this morning and found out that you can play the YouTube video, but you can't broadcast it. So... Like, you and me could be watching it right now, Chris, but nobody else would see it. So it'd just be us talking about the movie um, without seeing the movie. Yeah, who would want that? Yeah, nobody would want that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and here's our out-of-focus shot here that um, Andrew Gust and I uh, worked, worked hard on to uh, um, make it work a little better. Uh, actually, well, no, this isn't the shot right now. But uh, there's the shot. There's the out-of-focus shot right there. Uh, so what we did beforehand in the shot before is we, we slowly put uh, that shot out of focus so that when we got into this shot, it wouldn't look so weird. Um, that was some, you know, ingenuity on, on my behalf, I think. <laughs> uh, That's a joke. Crew member Jordan Norn says, it is not smooth. Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> Jordan, yeah, we, we, do, we do realize that. Thank you. Um, we apologize to everybody. Um, maybe just, like, squint but, your eyes a little bit, you know, like squint them, and then just listen to us. And then there you go. It's, it'll all be better. I, right? actually, I actually misrepresented him because he also said that our voices are great. So, Aww. And in, in sincerity after the sarcasm, Jordan, thank you for, well, not this scene because you weren't doing anything here. Maybe you were. <laughs> but um, this, it's just thank a, you for the excellent the sound one? in general. I am talking about the long one. Yeah. Well, no, Jordan did everything on every scene. Was, he was probably oh, the rafters. Yeah, I wasn't even there. Um. You weren't at this one? No, you were here. You were cam this. I, I was kidding. Um, <laughs> indeed, I was. Although, I, I, think, I think we actually had Mike Russell on the Zoom for this for once, which was nice for me. One of the, one of the major downsides of shooting on the Canon 5D, although there are a lot of major upsides as well, is that uh, the Zoom sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, and especially when you have a small crew and you're occasionally trying to operate and zoom at the same time. Um, well, it's, you know, it's a still camera. It's not supposed to 
shoot these fucking Polanski-ish scenes. No, yeah, you're not supposed to have smooth zooms on a still camera, no. no. <laughs> and uh, luckily, Mike is Mike owns the camera and, and did quite a good job of of uh, operating those zooms. But uh, that is a definite, definitely a thing to take in consideration when you're thinking about camera choice. Well, you know, to 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 not give Mike Russell as much credit. Because oh, I'm good. Up yes. for doing I was that. hoping we could. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's actually not Mike Russell pulling the zoom. Um, it's a little device he got called uh, what? What do you call that? Um, uh, some device he rented from Panavision that like uh, is like a, a hydraulic thing and it like moves the zoom with a button, um, which was very handy. Um, and Mike Russell did do a good job of using that. I was joking when I said that it wasn't him. But anyways, yeah, so it's a really handy device, and if you know if you are shooting with a DSLR, uh, you should look them up. I don't know what they're called, but basically it's like a little motorized device that uh, turns your zoom into like a, a servo zoom. There we go, servo zoom. I don't know. I don't know the technical <laughs> stuff. Um, but what did we use? Technical guys. <laughs> what did we use the other night that had a really nice, like you were able to pull off zooms by hand just by turning the the zoom ring, and you did a really good job of that. What camera? It was a Nikon, wasn't it? Oh, really? I thought yeah, they, I thought I totally fucked those up, actually. No, they looked pretty... Oh, well, I guess I didn't see them. I just assumed they were good. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's part of the problem. Yeah. Um, no, I think I fucked them up, yeah. Oh, okay. Never mind. But you're um, editing maybe, that one, right? So, yeah. So we're all set. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, this was fun. What we're watching right now. I really wanted right, right from the very beginning. I wanted this um, like mixture of jazz and kind of like Tony uh, traditional kind of horror sounds and music uh, throughout the whole soundscape of the movie. Uh, and I kind of implemented that in the visuals and in, within the editing. Gusto implemented it within the editing. I didn't have anything to do with that. I just told him I wanted that. But, yeah, I, I was kind of going for this, like, within the added, editing and within the, the shots and all that stuff, all the visuals, a kind of, like, jazzy kind of improvisational feel to it. And I felt like that last shot when we were, uh, you know, seeing uh, Jasper painting there, I thought was the perfect example of what I was looking for when I was uh, doing kind of the jazz visuals. So you're talking about the, the sort of the feel of jazz expressed visually as well? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. Or like what jazz looks like to you kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say okay. I... I... While, you're, while you're on the topic, you should talk a little bit about uh, our last minute uh, music change up and, and what that meant for... Oh, uh, yes. While uh, I get another oh. beer. Gosh, I don't know if I want to say it because um, I'm going to screw up their name. Uh, oh, shoot. Uh, well, anyways, we um, we had this wonderful old-timey jazz uh, throughout the whole score of Truth, and uh, it was great. I loved it. I found it all on a website called publicdomainjazz.org, I believe, which is a great website if you want to go listen to some jazz for free uh, and download it and do whatever. Uh, go to publicdomainjazz.org. And, you know, great jazz there. Uh, so I got all this great jazz music from there, and I slapped it into the, the, the soundtrack because it was, um, well, presumably it was public domain jazz. Uh, so we were, you know, we went to festivals with that cut, and we, you know, we screened that cut and everything. And then we got to about a month away from the premiere of the movie, uh, our YouTube premiere. And... Uh, I, I was just doing some last-minute research, just making sure everything was good, and I found that all but one of those jazz songs was actually not public domain worldwide. Um, we could release the music. We could release the the movie in Switzerland and in Canada and in a couple other countries, but if we wanted to release it anywhere else, we would have had to get permission uh, to use that music, and that would have costed us a lot of money. Um, so we couldn't do it. We had to, you know, either either we did like a tiny release of the movie or we had to get rid of the music. And that was a month before we had planned to release it. So um, 
so I kind of like hummed and hawed about it for a little while and wasted time. And we got down to the wire, and I'm like, fuck it. I just got to get rid of this music. I got to get rid of it because it's just going to haunt us. You know, we're going to keep on running into problems with it. And I was really worried about it. I didn't want to get sued, uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, so I, I was bumming around the internet, and I found this awesome, awesome French gypsy jazz band called Lache Swing. Chris, do you think I'm spell pronouncing that right? Lache Swing? <laughs> yeah, Chris doesn't even know who I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> I think it's Lache Swing. I'm going to put the, uh, the actual name in the description and everything so you can take a look at them. Wonderful, no, wonderful gypsy jazz band and um, uh, French also. So uh, And they didn't speak the best English. So I contacted them right away and uh, was like, hey, you know, we're down with the wire. We really love your music. Can we have it? And uh, they got back to me like the same day, and he's like, "Yes, of course, we would love to." So uh, yeah, uh, we 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 got their music, we got the rights, and then we had to put the music into the movie. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't have anybody to do that. And I, I I like to think that I'm a pretty good sound editor, but I'm not good enough to do a final mix. So again, we were probably a week away from putting it up on YouTube. And uh, we had to find a sound mixer and editor to put the music into the movie uh, so that we could make it live. So luckily, our executive producer of this of this little live stream, Kat Jeffcott, she um, she works in the sound industry. Sound, is, do you think sound industry? Is that the right term for it? Sound? No, she's yelling at me from the other room. No. What should I she call works it? In the, she works in the sound. She works with the sound. <laughs> so she found this amazing guy who, you know, uh, with zero notice and zero money, uh, like we weren't giving him any money, agreed to, um, to edit in and mix in uh, our music for us. And that was Dan Moser. So there's our third shout out. Thank you, Dan, for doing that. I still have yet to send you your rum. Perhaps I'm just going to let you keep that hard drive and, you know, do what you want with it. Anyways, why am I telling... He's not even here, so. Uh, but that's the he story. So, <laughs> hey Dan. Uh, so we got the music in, and uh, and mm. I'm glad we did because now we don't have to worry about it. Um, we we own all the rights worldwide to everything, so um, we're not breaking any laws, right? Not as of this moment. No. Which is good. So here's one of the one of the key sequences. Um, I don't know something I always thought was a little bit bold about. Bye now. Bye now. Something I always thought was a little bit bold about truth, especially. Um, I mean, primarily on on Jason's part. I'm I'm not talking so much about my writing, but something I think that's interesting about the movie is that uh, these really cinematic sort of sequences uh, like this montage that we're watching now where we're ideally establishing sort of an entire relationship between Becca and this book and what the book represents and, and the writer of the book and the idea of, of sort of transmission of self through literary means and all these sort of big ideas um, that, are, that are transmitted visually basically and, and only visually and that's something uh, for me as a filmmaker and as a director that that is tricky and I think something that in independent film we don't always see a lot there's a lot of emphasis on um, well you know on dialogue and on on acting the independent film is about actors a lot and about about seeing the characters and about seeing people do some really daring and original and unique work which is really cool but um, but there's sometimes I feel a uh, an important part of the of, of the film tradition, American film tradition as a whole, that that can get lost in a lot of independent film, which is which is the ability to to tell a story through the through the grammar of film and through the the visual grammar of film specifically. Um, and I, I don't mean to talk down on mumblecore or anything, but when you're mentioning that, that's the first thing that comes to mind mm -hmm. uh, is the mumblecore movement, which um which is huge now, and uh, while well, it's Dying out a little bit, but um, you know, and that's based around simply s the script, the dialogue, and uh, and the actors. Like the the visuals are just you know 
do whatever visuals just to get by, just to see the acting and to get the script on 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 camera, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Which is, I mean, which I think is something that I align a bit more with than than you do, Jay. But um, but definitely, I think I think it's I think it's gutsy in a way for a film that is this small to take these chances on being cinematic and on being cinematically expressive um, because it's really easy it's really easy to tell an indie story through dialogue and it's not always so easy either for the director or on the production end to tell an indie story through visuals so I think that's something that I like about truth anyway regardless well, that, of how successful it's seen in general that, that's, that's, that's what happens when you have such a, like, a, a visual genius like myself um, get on board on a project is you just it's, it's like that <laughs> that was that was for you <laughs> thanks dude <laughs> that was, that was a visual genius <laughs> oh, oh man I really want to jo Jordan I'm having trouble with the comments here they're not popping up. They're not popping up in Hangouts, and I can see that there have been five comments on the on the live stream in YouTube, but I can't see any of the comments. Um, executive producer Cat, would you be able to see if you could uh, maybe not on the computer that we're broadcasting on, but take a look and see if you could see the comments? If there's any way, I don't know. Um, if you can't I, figure it out, no stress. I was briefly able to see a comment in which Jordan Orn pointed out that a website that you referred to does not exist, so that was good. I can't move the screen. Um, one second. Uh, try, uh, are you on the other computer? No. Okay, never mind then. Nope, there's no way we can't figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. The whole point we did this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but... I saw them briefly, so maybe they'll maybe they'll pop up again. Oh, okay. Um, uh, There's seven. There are seven comments now. Uh, executive producer Cat may have figured it out. Um, just go to the Cat is the number of power, according yeah. to Stephen King, as um, explained she, in the book It. About what? Killer what about Curry. Stephen King? I wasn't Nothing. listening go to on. you. Okay, I wasn't. Um, Cat Jeffcott is going to look on um, on YouTube's. At the comments, so folks, we'll get to your uh, we'll get to your questions. We're sorry, we're still figuring this thing out. Um, this is the first of many. We're gonna do this a bunch with all of our movies. So, um, this I think was the thing you and I were. Yeah, there's a there's a distant cheer going up all around the world. Yeah, <laughs> more of this. Uh, but we were really excited about this. This is more for us, to be fair. But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> No, you wouldn't, no. <laughs> um, well, no, okay. What I was saying is when Chris and I were first discussing doing the YouTube release, um, we were really excited about the idea that it, it's a more social way to, to distribute a film because we can interact with people via comments, you know, right on the video, uh, which is great, lovely. Like, you, I, I think Netflix should be doing something like that. I think that's very important, I think... That's really cool. But again, I guess the filmmakers won't really go onto Netflix and comment back. Anyways, uh, so that's one thing. And then another thing that Your voice is totally cut out for me. I'm not sure if that's true for others. Or maybe I've totally cut out. You're still talking, so that's a good sign. Chris will find it. Oh! You're back. Mr. Chris, I'm back. You, you cut out for about a minute for me. Hey! Hey. We're back? 
I'm back. Welcome okay. back, me. I'll stop downloading porn again. Oh, okay. That's great. Um, oh, and I think we just lost the video now. Oh, no, there it is. Yeah. Do We're people, back. We're back. Do people download Hello, porn everybody. still? Um, okay, folks, uh, I'm going to take a break. Do people like... I think they do. I I would never do that, but um, we'll see. Chris, you take the lead. You like take it, the lead for two seconds. You can I talk about in, my cat here if you want. Put um, it on. If not, looks like the uh, looks like the gargoyle from uh, which 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 what what's the '80s anthology? It has a gargoyle. It's the second one. She falls in love with the dude, and then he... No, no, he falls in love with with woman, and she eventually turns out to be a gargoyle. In any case, uh, <laughs> this is perfect timing for Jason to leave, because this is the infamous uh, 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 phone call sequence, as well as the infamous flashback shot, which I cannot stand uh, the flashback to remind you what we're talking about. There's going to be one in my movie April, too, so that's great. Um, but this is the infamous phone call scene that just goes on and on and on, and we're just standing standing here, and, and you know, she, she hangs up the phone and redials, and we have to listen to her get an answering machine and so on. And uh, it, it was a big debate uh, between between myself and, and Gusto Editing and, and Jason about the shot in particular. But what I think it really... Shows, at least, is is that it's important at a, at a certain point, especially on this size of film. Um, there needs to be one voice that's that's coming through, and I think Truth is a film that's very much of Jason, um, and this is one of one of the examples of of being of Jason for better or for worse. We're staring at uh, a woman talk. Being on the phone for five minutes or, or whatever. Um, but would it be, would it be a better film without it? I don't know if you can make that claim because I think I think the purpose of, I think the purpose ultimately of film as with any work of art is to to take a bit of yourself and put it out into the world. And I think when we when we sort of start to censor. Our, our idiosyncrasies out of a out of a film when we're a director and we, we find a certain thing really appealing and, and everyone else thinks it's kind of dumb or not the not the thing to be in a film. Uh, I think that's where we, we really start to, to see some progress because that's where you're seeing uh, a human. You know, that's where that's where you're seeing some random little part of a person being crushed down into into film form and then and then transmitted out to you, which is kind of cool. I think it do, it might not always make for the for the the best, fastest, most appealing, most uh, palatable and easily digestible watch, but I think it makes for the most important watch because it's it's the most truthful, I guess. Well, I got I got two things to say about that. I'm glad you brought that up because uh, it, it's funny that you were talking about it in a negative way because I, I know so, a lot of people do feel that way, but um, Google has this, uh, YouTube has this great tool where you can see where people are watching and where people stop watching the movie. And uh, a positive peak in the movie, uh, a spot where people are watching the most, is actually that scene, um, which is very funny. And they drop off before that scene and they drop off after. But during that scene, people seem to be tuning in more. Um, oh, which I don't go. know, got, like, about got yet, comments. you know, I do hear a lot of people saying it goes on forever. Okay. All right. Um, comments. Yeah. Okay. Well, there are more. There are more comments than questions. <laughs> uh, first up, we have Wisdom Nugget, who says that would have been awesome, and it probably would have been. Yeah, Wisdom Nugget. I I know Wisdom Nugget. Wisdom Nugget. Thanks for tuning in, man. I agree. It would have been awesome, but I had to keep my pants on. It's just you know inappropriate to take them off. So. Thanks for tuning in, and hopefully next time I'll take my pants off. Next up, is this how I commentary? Yes. What beer did you just finish, CN Shalom? The beer I just finished is the Organic Lager from Mill Street Brewery. 
And I'm now on to uh, uh, a fastly rising favorite of mine, which is the Village Wit, a light wheat ale. It, uh, it is quite something. And uh, mine, I've been working on these Lucky Buddhas, which is some of my favorite beers, I think. Actually, my, my favorite beer is Lucky Buddha. Uh, so the, I got a six-pack of this, and it's a very, very refreshing beer. What does... Buddha think about the concept of luck. I'm not sure. Perhaps someone can enlighten us in the comments. Uh, next up, Jordan Norton posted like 90 comments about how great he is. Okay. It's true. Uh, Jordan Norton is great. Yeah. And Shadow Scotsman says, I nearly didn't notice this was going on. Damn. Woo. I thought my PC was having a dirt moment. He returns. Thank you, Shadow Scotsman. Um, uh, our, our PC is having a derp. Moment. It is Not we yours. who are the derps. Yeah, we are the derping ones, yeah. That's, that's all I got for you. <laughs> that's all I got. Well, thank you. Good. Well, that, uh, that's a good start. I didn't even think we'd get one, so perfect. No, it's nice. That's nice. It's great. Oh, and still, I'm so happy now. Still, though, no one has issued a single slur against me or us, which I'm kind of disappointed about. Yeah, you know, well... We really we really want to get across that that we're, we're the whole thing. We're the guys here. We're the guys uploading the movie. We're the guys responding to comments. We're the, we're the people watching everything and taking care of everything. And, and this is our film that's out here for you to, to react to us as, as strongly... As as you want, so so please, by all means, if you just want to, you know, log on and 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 yell at us for being idiots, that would be uh, totally appropriate and probably entirely correct. That's what we're looking for. And it's uh, someone someone asked me the other day. There was uh, people are starting to do uh, YouTube video uh, reviews of our movie. We have another one coming out in a couple of weeks. I'm oh, pretty is this one by a dog this. too? Yeah, that's the one by the dog. And someone asked me the other day, you know. Um, did did that hurt your movie because the dog didn't like the movie? Um, but no, I mean that stuff never hurts. That stuff, well, it helps us personally, and uh, you know any comment is good. I mean it, it just adds to the experience. It's like we were saying, we really like the idea of like a social movie or a social viewing, you know, platform where people can interact and talk about what they've just seen. You know bitch about what they saw, love it, you know, hate it, whatever. They can comment on it and, and be a part of the process of, of movies, uh, which I think is something new, and I hope it continues. I hope that people start posting more movies on, on YouTube because I think it's a great medium for it. What, um, do you, what do you think, how do you feel about the, the potentially negative side of that, Jay, which is, which is uh, that we've seen such, a, such an emphasis on... on um, Catering to to public opinion, in in major in Hollywood films, um, that we get these these kind of cobbled together nonsense movies that that never really have any spark of life to them, and I, and I think that could be said to be to be a result of of the same sort of thing in a way that we're really thinking, okay, what's the world saying to us? We have the whole internet to tell us to tell us what's going on. Well, I don't think I understand the question. Go one more time there. Um, my question, my question is, I guess, do you, do you think that, do you think that the internet, the, the, the increased availability of, of interaction between, between filmmaker and, and audience, uh, do you think it also has the, that negative side with, with Hollywood blockbusters? That, it, that oh it's yeah, yeah, yeah. All the easier to pander or to cater or to. Yes. Live. Oh, I totally. Yeah. Well, I mean, look at Marvel. There's the perfect example Absolutely. of um, of shit, basically. I know I just probably a couple of people have just stopped watching because of that, but um, yeah, I mean, um, I think that exactly is is the perfect example of um, where it goes wrong. But in that case, I mean, that's going to happen no matter what, right? Um, if they don't get that opinion from the people on the internet, they're going to get that opinion from people somewhere else. They're going to that no matter what, that company is catering to someone. And that's the way the company is set up. They're trying to make this 
perfect, well, not perfect. They're not trying to make a perfect movie. They're trying to make a movie that appeals exactly to mm -hmm. an audience, right? A, per a perfectly balanced movie or... Yeah, exactly. And that's going to happen no matter what, whether the internet exists or not. That was happening before the internet existed. Um, there's a lot of movies that were made because people were like, well, it's time for another buddy cop movie. People are excited about buddy cop. We need to make another buddy cop movie that follows these exact you know, specifications um, for a buddy cop movie. So it's going to exist no matter what. And I think it's... And it's I, guess something that's a, I guess something that's a little bit different with us too is is whether or not we think people are going to like something, we're still going to do it. We just delight in hearing that they didn't like it afterwards, perhaps. Maybe that's not a good thing, though. We just keep on doing whatever we want. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard. To, well, that's what, I don't know. That's There's the, a balance. The There's a balance. Provocateur, perhaps. And what, what is it we learned in film school? The art and commerce of it. you got, you got to balance it uh, to make something. I learned to go to a cheaper film school next time. Yeah, that too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we go. Um, here's one of... Uh, speaking of when people <laughs> drop out of the movie, this is, this is one point where we lose a lot of viewers right here, which... Well, this is the... Yeah. To me, it's kind of crushing, but um, I guess that happens, so... Because it's the best scene in the movie. Yeah. Well, this is my demo reel scene. I love this scene. Um, and originally, not, you know, I don't mean this as any negative thing, but the actors had wanted to do this sitting down, um, like stationary. And it was a pretty big fight with them to get them up and going. They, they, they had planned the scene out. And I, I totally respect them for this because they had worked on the scene a lot together because it's a pretty big scene. And they had planned out the scene... Uh, where they're sitting down on the bed together and they're fighting and it's a more intimate kind of, you know, close face-to-face -face thing. And uh, we got the scene and they were like, well, no, we, we had actually planned it out sitting down. And um, we had to take a good, like, you know, hour or so discussing it with him, with them. And I was finally at the end like, no, we're, we're going to do this scene standing up. We're going to do it moving back and forth because um, that's what the movie needed. Uh, and you can tell a good actor when you know, they don't agree with you, but yet they still pull off an awesome scene like this. Because um, they definitely didn't agree with me, but they, they put it aside and they were like, okay, well, we'll do it. We'll do how you want it. And they did it. And they did an amazing job. So, yeah. How, how had you storyboarded this scene? Uh, I don't think I storyboarded this one. Uh, this one was one where I was like, well, we're going to do it in a winter, and we're going to be sitting right. somewhere in the room. So, um... <laughs> that's funny. Eh? That's what that's what I always do, too. It's like, well, it's going to be a winter, so I, I, won't, I won't think about how we're shooting it. <laughs> when it's, like, the most well, complicated... It's, it was a little movie. harder for your movie. Yeah. For April, it was a little harder, because we were in tougher... Um, tougher locations, but in truth we had the cabin, uh, which was a very stable, easy location to work around. So uh, this scene was a lot easier to pull off um, by just saying that. But I found in April we ran into a lot of problems where that came up, and I think, that's, I think that is a good way of handling it, but um, I know we, we, you and me, I was frustrated a lot of the times because I was ca cam up in Chris's, we're talking about Chris's movie, April which we shot in a week, uh, another feature as well that will be coming out on YouTube. And uh, I was cam hopping for him, and I, I was frustrated a lot of times because Chris wanted to do these lovely shots like this uh, where we're going back and forth in the action. Um, and I, I'm not as good of a cam hop as Chris is, and uh, you know my, my brain doesn't work quite as quickly as Chris's does. And uh, it was tough for me to concentrate on trying to find the beats within the scene uh, and move the camera at the right time. So, uh, I mean, that's that's important for a cam op to know when he's doing scenes like this, uh, to know where the beats are and to know when to move. Uh, and I think these scenes a lot of the time rest on the cam op because they do have so much power within the scene. And I wonder sometimes how, like, uh, Woody Allen's cam op works 
with these big oneers that are panning back and forth between people. I'm sure that Woody Allen is involved more in it, but I'm sure there's still a fair bit that is left up to the cam op. Well, if you yeah, I mean if you if you look at later Woody though, it's like I don't think Woody's involved at all really, because <laughs> like if you take I don't know like uh, 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 Manhattan Murder Mystery, I think the reason, I mean obviously some of the oneers are pretty meticulously planned, but but others I think are just shot that way so that the the actors can can just stay in the scene and the cam op can just kind of do his or her thing. I don't know who Woody's cam op is. But um, I think I think later, at least in Woody's career, there was kind of a just like ah, the cam up will, <laughs> you know, well fitting fitting Woody Allen in general. We've got uh, we've got one more comment here from from Jordan Norn yet again, uh, but it is a question. It, it is in the form of a question this time. Oh, okay. he wants he wants to know. So was this cabin built on an Indian burial ground or what? <laughs> well, Jordan, uh, funny enough, it was actually. Um, there was this uh, Native American tribe on the island of Galliano, and um, they uh, they just so happened to build an Indian burial ground underneath this uh, <laughs> this cabin. Um, well, uh, <laughs> like the cabin wasn't burial. built. The cabin wasn't built at the time. They built it. They did the burial ground first, <laughs> and then the cabin was built. Um, so yeah, Jordan, actually, yeah. yeah. Uh, is it inappropriate to say Indian now? Um, well, when, no. <laughs> With, when they, talking they, about they Native Americans. When, when you're talking about Indians, it's appropriate, yeah. Yeah, but Native um, Americans. Uh, but if you're going to get away with it in, in any contest, I suppose it's ironically referring to the, the, the film filmic tropes of the past. Um, Chris, you might need to take over for a second. It looks like we're having some video issues. Okay. A moment. I'll. Uh, oh yeah, we do appear to be having some video issues. I'll just check the. YouTube out of curiosity. Anyway, I'm I'm taking over now. I'm still Chris Shalom, co-producer, co-writer, camera operator. But seriously, uh, to 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 continue, I guess on on my point um, about independent filmmakers. I mean that's. You know that's probably the defining defining difference between between the the studio director and the and the uh, independent director is is the amount of uh, the amount of control they're going to be given over the project and and I guess uh, therefore which stream they're they're going to be attracted to. I mean I, I always wonder about 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 major filmmakers like uh, well J J Abrams is the one I'm thinking of now who. Who sort of, I imagine, has quite, has quite a lot of control over his films, but then at the same time, is sort of restricted in to to the fundamental uh, sort of structure and as well to a fundamental uh, approach to filmmaking that 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 um, that we are not restricted by. I mean, Truth is a film that that takes advantage of a lot of existing horror tropes and also takes advantage of a lot of existing uh, relationship movie tropes and obviously with, with any film that you're going to make there's going to be a it's going to be part of, a, of the film tradition that's been that's been developing since since the start of time and playing to different genres and, and playing contextually within within a certain time frame but but when you when you when you're directing a major film even even if you have total control over it I, I imagine that there's this sort of you know you you're a major part of popular culture at that point, and also, and also, I guess, a major creator of popular culture, and I think that limits you in a way. I mean, even if it's so simple as as to think about um, uh, to think about the roles of of male and female characters in a film, 
uh, although although truth uh, to me is is questionable in some of its <laughs> use of gender roles. But um, but if if you take a if you take a film like any movie that J.J. Abrams makes, there's necessarily the the female is the, going to be the bearer of meaning and and is going to be uh, sort of relegated to to a secondary role no matter no matter what. Um, not not just even not even just in the story, but in sort of in the tradition of the way that we we shoot different genders, or we shoot different races, or we approach different uh, topics, or 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 even how we how we how we cast, how we see things. I think I think pop culture films are necessarily a reflection as well of as a, an addition to the culture that they arise in, and so. You don't see in in large films, even with the most controlling directors, you don't see the, the real expression of of personality and of self that I that I feel I see in, in in a lot of independent films. So I'm not sure if I, I guess on that note, I'm not sure what you think about this, Jason. But I'm not sure if either of us will ever be poised exactly to. To, to direct major blockbusters just because um, with a blockbuster there, there comes a long tradition that that I think uh, that I think is based on values that maybe are are different than those that you and I have and as well um, well it, more than based on it is is controlled by and, and, and shackled to a value system that that's that's very sort of normative and, and is very restrictive on art, I guess, in a way, and very restrictive on on creating to me to real characters or characters that represent the people that I actually know or the or the situations that I actually experience. I, I would agree, but also disagree in a way because uh, the, the whole idea of, of a blockbuster uh, from the very beginning. Again, I didn't hear everything you said, so I'm coming in at the end here. But right from the very child. beginning, um, a blockbuster. Sorry, go on. <laughs> guy. I'm just big uh, 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 the blockbuster right at the beginning was um, was so revolutionary because it was like the B movies turned into mm -hmm. an A movie, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and then it just like and then those B movies didn't they weren't B movies anymore. They were the A movies. They were the blockbusters. Uh, so making making spectacle and giving spectacular treatment to to just the fun, dumb things that we had before seen as... Exactly. Yeah. And now what we're seeing now, though, and uh, a lot of people haven't picked this up, which is surprising, is that the blockbusters have, have molded and changed. Like, obviously, there's still the B-movie blockbuster, which um, isn't a B-movie. It is a blockbuster, which is like, you know, Avatar or, uh, uh, you know, like the Marvel movies, so on and so forth. You know, movies that would have been a B-movie back in the day, yeah. but now are blockbusters. But now you look and there's like the comedy blockbusters. So th th like that's a new thing. That's relatively new. Sorry, uh, say that again. The which blockbusters? The, the comedy blockbusters. Oh, or like, okay. Yeah. Um, even the, the, there's some dramatic blockbusters now. So I'm interested to see you know where the blockbuster goes and and changes to because I mean it, it was a pretty significant change when. The comedy blockbuster became something, uh, and I I don't think a lot of people really talk about that a lot. And I'm talking about like the, um, uh, like the Owen Wilson Whatchamacallit movies, you know, like Owen Wilson with uh, Vince Vaughn or like well, you know, if you, if Hangover. If you inter interrupt for one second, and this is more yeah. modern than you're talking about, but if if you just next time you go to the theater, if you look at the marketing. For the new Hangover movie or the new Anchorman movie, I think you'll see exactly what Jason's talking about. They're marketed as major cultural uh, events, which would have been ridiculous not very long ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like even Caddyshack or Ghostbusters was pushing the limit um, for what they could do with, uh, with uh, a comedy movie. And now you look at comedies and they're huge. And... Um, Again, and that was the same as when B movies started to become like when Jaws was released. It was like, what? What is? What's this movie? Why is it being done so big? Why is it being marketed like this? Why is it in huge theaters? Um, 
and you know that's that that's slowly happening. So, in in that sense, uh, you know, what where will where will the blo- blockbusters be? You know, when we get to that point when we can direct a blockbuster, maybe they'll be you know already farty films, right? Uh, and in that case, no. we would probably <laughs> like to. Maybe, they might. But yes. Yeah. Your point is taken. Definitely. <laughs> Especially like if if Hollywood drastically changes um, or burns to the ground, as as is my hope, um, then yeah, it would make sense that that we'd seek out something totally different as a cultural phenomenon, especially with films in general and the the film experience and the theater experience shrinking uh, or or taking on less importance with with the growth of of Netflix and YouTube and all the other wonderful at your fingertips things. Um, it, it could it could be could be artsy films or like at least as artsy as seventies seventies big movies. Yeah, uh, jo- Jordan. Uh, well, I don't know if. Oh, uh, we just have a couple more comments from Jordan Norn. He has <laughs> just a public apology for the phrase "Indian burial ground." Although <laughs> to 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 contextualize uh, <laughs> to contextualize that, uh, it's all Jason's fault. Yeah, it's all my fault. Um, uh, in the comment section, no, in the uh, description, um, I'll, I'll put a link to a, uh, a deleted scene that we had where um, we were just laughing our asses off behind the camera where Jordan Norn, who's commenting right now, went up to our, our lead uh, guy and uh, mentioned to him that this cabin was built on an Indian burial ground. And that wasn't Jordan's idea. That was Chris and I, and we were very giddy about doing that. <laughs> oh, maybe it wasn't even you, Chris. I think it was just me, to be fair. Um, anyways, Jordan. No, it was all it was all you. It was all me. <laughs> there's, there's no question about that. So, not to worry, Jordan. <laughs> um, that being said, too, as you could probably tell, our uh, I killed our computer in the other room. Uh, therefore, our stream has stopped, unfortunately. Um, so if we have a few more questions, we'll answer them. But if not, we'll probably be wrapping it up right away here. And hopefully next time, we'll have ironed out some of these issues that we're having right now, and we'll have a, a smoother live stream. But um, to be fair, I thought we, you know, considering I've stupid YouTube changed that YouTube thing, I think we did a pretty good job. So, yeah. Uh, is well, there? We're, we're all glad that that you think you you've done a good job, Jason. Yeah, I said we we as in you, me, and Cat Jeff got. Oh well, me and Cat go without saying. Uh, I do not see any more comments. However, Jordan points out that the video is now flipping between the two of us. Oh, is it? Well, then that's a perfect time People to... People uh, get to look at our lovely faces and my yeah. microphone. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. Again, sorry about the technical issues. Hopefully, we'll figure it out next time. Uh, it was fun. Uh, we'll try to do it again soon. Pass this along. Oh, I'm burping. Oh, God. Uh, share the movie Pass with your that friends. Along. Yeah, pass that along. Share the movie with your friends. Share this broadcast with your friends. Um, uh, spread the word, you know. Um, have fun, you know. Have fun Halloween. This is our Halloween um, broadcast. So, you know, have a good Halloween. Uh, Chris, are you going to have a good Halloween? I'm going to uh, drink some beer. Uh, you know what I'm going you know what I'm going to do for Halloween because I'm in this large house in this rich neighborhood. Alone, uh, the sort of the sort of family neighborhood where where you know rich suburban families bring their their kids around is I'm going to turn all the lights off and drink beer in the dark and pretend that I don't hear the door because I'm not going to buy candy for the kids. So, looking forward to that. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. That's, you can end it.